Well, welcome to America Living Today. I'm Gordon Robertson. Hey, everyone, and I'm Ashley Key. Andrew Turnbull was born with an undeveloped lung and a heart on the wrong side of his body. It's a rare condition and one that almost killed him during the first few days of his life. We were definitely excited. It was going to be our second child. It was going to be very fun and interesting to add a son to the mix. On April 8, 2005, Doug and Audrey Turnbull welcomed their first son, Andrew, into the world. It's hard to describe. I mean, it's, it's a euphoria, it's peace, a comfort, uh, and great, great excitement. Since Audrey had a C-section, she was still lying on the table as nurses took the baby aside for assessment. After a few minutes, she realized she hadn't heard him cry. It took a while for the cry to come, but then when he did make his first cry, it was actually a muffled cry. I even said, wow, his cry sounds really funny. Meanwhile, nurses noted that the newborn's skin wasn't turning pink, a sign he was having trouble getting enough oxygen. They put him in an incubator, hoping it would help. They actually wheeled him in the incubator to me, uh, it was just like a little hood over his head, so I could at least see him, but they only let him stay at my side for at least a minute or less. They then decided, we, we need to get him down to the NICU. Doctors at Women's Hospital of Texas admitted Andrew to the neonatal intensive care unit. X-rays revealed that his heart was on the wrong side of his chest and one of his lungs was underdeveloped. Further testing showed extreme pressure in his lungs, preventing his body from getting the oxygen it needed. In that moment, it's hard to wrap your mind around the real depth and complexity of the actual health problems that he had. The next day, Andrew was transported to Texas Children's Hospital next door, where he was diagnosed with scimitar syndrome. It's a rare condition where major organs are displaced. In Andrew's case, he had two veins going from his lungs into the wrong side of his heart, limiting the flow of oxygen. Dr. Charlita Guillory was Andrew's neonatologist. You could have organ failure of any organ, the kidneys, the brain, any organ could be affected as a result of that. He was in the group of babies that had the highest mortality, morbidity, at risk for not surviving. We had this feeling of spiraling. It's like that drain that spirals. Over the next two days, Andrew's oxygen levels continued to drop. At that particular time, we were doing the maximal therapy we could give to Andrew. And we knew in order to do more, we needed to do a cardiac cath or an MRI. But Andrew was so sick, we knew we couldn't move him to do the test that we needed to do. One of the surgeons at one point said, we don't have a game plan, so to take him to an operating room without knowing how he's wired, we, we may lose him on the table because we just don't know what, what we're dealing with. Audrey tried to make sense of what was happening. What could I have done differently? How could I have caused this? Is it something in our environment that caused it? And your mind starts to race on the what if scenarios. It's scary. The unknown is very scary. Doug and Audrey held on by faith and asked friends and relatives to pray. We had people from all over the United States um, that were able to call across, you know, prayer chains and churches across all denominations. And when you realize there's nothing that you can physically do for him but pray, then that's all we have to do. Four days after Andrew was born, Audrey and Doug received the news they feared most. The doctor came out with tears streaming down her face and said, he, he's just not going to make it through the day. So uh, <sighs> she said, call whoever you want, family, but he probably will not make it through the day. So that's when it, that's when it hit you as a dad. All I could do was internally just pray, pray for my own strength, pray for wisdom and pray for guidance. Then during the night, Andrew's oxygen levels began to stabilize. He began to gradually improve without us changing anything, and certainly without surgery, he began to improve. 
The improvement was so drastic, doctors were able to wean him off of medications and machines. You don't even know what to do after you've heard, you know, the, the exciting news that he has a probability now of making it. Andrew's MRI showed that his vital organs had not been damaged. After six weeks in the hospital, he went home. <laughs> Today, Andrew is a healthy, active 11-year-old. While his doctors still keep an eye on him, he's had no residual problems. I would consider um, Andrew's recovery an awesome blessing. All you can say is, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I do believe Andrew's miracle is an act of God because there was no other way he would have survived. Absolutely I love incredible. It when God acts and yeah. when you look at things and say, this was a miracle, that was certainly a miracle. If you need a miracle in your life today, we're going to be praying at the end of this broadcast, especially for you. We're showing you stories to encourage your faith, to let you know you can never be too dead for a resurrection. Mm -hmm. God wants to heal. It's, it's part of his nature. It's part mm -hmm. of one of his names. It's he is your healer. Absolutely. When you come to him, he wants to. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are many times in our lives that we question God a lot of times when we're going through hard things as Andrew's parents, I'm sure, were going through. They weren't sure if he was going to be able to live. What in your life has really helped you trust God even when it was hard? For me, it was having a pastor tell me, um, and it was T.L. Osborne, he said, why is argumentative? Mm. Uh, and that really opened up my eyes to, I don't want to come to God with an argument. Mm. Wow. And then I, I really studied, uh, I think all of us studied the Bible, but in John chapter 9, it was the disciples who bought the question. They were asking why. Why did this happen? And it was a man born blind. You know, what's the fault here? Because we're always looking, why did this happen? What did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, what about, you know, God, you're not running the universe right. All of those things. Yeah. And Jesus said, this, no, to put all that away. This happened that the glory of the Lord would be revealed. When you have that attitude facing the problems of life, many of the afflictions of the, uh, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. So, you know, look for that deliverance and come to him and say, God, I have this problem. Daddy, I have this problem. Uh, when I go to my earthly father, um, I, I wouldn't say he was the cause of it. I would say, can you help me? And when we have that same attitude with God Almighty, yes. Mm, miracles happen. All right, guys, well, we got another miracle story for you. After only a year of marriage, Christina became a widow. Two years after her husband died, she still struggled with depression. So whenever one of her oppressive thoughts entered her mind, Christina opened her Bible, and that led to a powerful answer to her prayers. My mind would just spin in circles. It's just this everyday heaviness, this sadness that you can't run from. Christina and her husband Carmine were married a year and a half when they welcomed their daughter Roman to the world. It should have been one of the most joyous times of their lives, but it soon became clear that something was wrong with Carmine. He said that he had these headaches, and I just remember like, when he used those words of, can you just make Roma, like, stop crying? It's, it hurts. It, um, because if you knew Carmine, you know that he, he really wanted a family and he was so happy to have, to have Roma. And he loved her very much, like, when she was born and up until about a month and a half, it was just pure, like, pure joy and pure bliss. Carmine went to the doctor, but his headaches were dismissed as stress-related and he returned home. The headaches only worsened in the coming days until one night Christina woke to the smell of something burning on the stove. She went downstairs to investigate, and that's when Carmine had a seizure. It all happened so fast and I, sat myself in his lap to try to control like his body movements. Christina quickly called 911. However, 
By the time Carmine got to the hospital, it was too late. He had suffered a severe brain abscess that caused massive swelling and bleeding. The doctor said there was nothing they could do, and he was taken off life support. I, I knew that when I left the room, it would be the last time that I'll see him. And um, I walked down the hallway. I just I was felt so alone. The pain of losing Carmine was overwhelming for Christina. The love of her life was gone, and she now had to raise Roma on her own. I felt unequipped. I felt nervous and, and mad and angry that I had to do this on my own. Like, why me? What have I done? I literally just had a baby, and we were just starting our family life together, and it was just taken from me. All of those thoughts and questions flooded my mind every single day. I was raised in a Christian home, and my faith was always pretty strong. Um, but it wasn't until Carmine passed away that I really leaned on God more than I ever had before. Christina prayed that God would help her and turn to encouraging verses in the Bible whenever oppressive thoughts entered her mind. I've seen people within my own family turn away from God, and I've seen firsthand what that looks like. And I did not want Roma to see me fall into that. And I have to show her what it looks like to trust God. But I chose to read my Bible and read what God said and trust that he was going to provide me with the love that I needed to get me through. For the next two years, Christina struggled with the persistent grief that weighed on her heart. But then something slowly began to change within her. I think that I had just come to this realization within my spirit I w that was, uh, God wants to see me happy again. There's, there is joy. I know there's joy somewhere. I felt that I was ready to find that joy. Some of her heaviness began to lift as she took Roma to New York to visit a friend. While attending a local church, she met the worship leader, Alan. The thought of falling in love again never crossed my mind. I had become so close in my relationship with Jesus. I was, I was good. When I first met Alan, I noticed, I, I, I noticed that there were uh, feelings there, but a part of me was, I can't do that. I felt guilty because in my mind and in my heart, I was, I was still married to Carmine. But as she prayed, Christina realized that God was opening up her heart to this opportunity, the chance to love and be loved by someone again. And then Roma did something that helped confirm those feelings. Roma doesn't give high fives to anybody, and she gave him a high five, and that was a pretty big deal. <laughs> Christina and Alan eventually married and moved to California. Together, they've had two daughters, Brooklyn and Virginia. Along with Roma, the five of them have found peace and immense joy, which Christina credits all to God, answering her prayers. God has been really good through the whole entire journey of, of my grief. He brought Alan into my life, and Roma loves him like he's her dad. And it's very special because she says all the time, I have a daddy in heaven that loves her. But she also has a daddy here that loves her just as much. Choosing to trust God doesn't take away your circumstances, but choosing to trust God does provide you everything you need to get through it. And that's exactly what he did for me. Choosing to trust God, and no matter what circumstance, what trial, what fire you might be walking through, gives you everything you need. Hear that truth from Christina today. It's such a beautiful story of what God is able to do with our lives. He can turn the horrible situations 
into something beautiful. The ashes, the broken pieces of our lives, He can turn into something beautiful. He gives us uh, joy for mourning. He can do that in your life. And Christina went to the Word of God when she was feeling overwhelmed by grief because of that horrible situation. It's okay to be honest and say, this is a situation I never thought I would be in and I don't want to be in. It's okay to be honest about that. But go to the Word of God like Christina did. When she was overwhelmed, she went to the Word of God and it was the promises of the Lord that helped her overcome grief and start to experience joy like never before. And I believe God is willing and able to do that in your life if you just let him. And I just wanna share a scripture with you. Let's go to the Bible like Christina did. This is John 9, 3. This is, his disciples were asking him, God, why is this man born blind? And at that time, a lot of people understood if you were born with a certain disease or something like that, it was because you sinned or the parents sinned. But this is, this is what Jesus said in response to their question. Again, John 9, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. What would happen in your own life if you took that scripture to heart? not blaming God, not angry with him, but understanding and having the shift in our minds and the shift in our perspective that God is doing something in our lives and it's for our good. And it's so his glory can be displayed in and through me and in and through this situation. Jesus also says, take heart. He says, look, you will face many trials and tribulations in this world, but take heart or be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. You can overcome, my friend. It is not the end for you. The best is yet to come. God wants to use your situation, your trial, your testimony in powerful, powerful ways. Just keep believing, keep praying, keep trusting in Him. Well, we have a magazine called Miracle Living Today, and it has stories of people who have seen God answer their prayers. And to get your free copy, all you have to do is give us a call, 1-800-700-7000, or you can also visit www.miraclelivingtoday.com. We just want to continue to encourage you in your faith because we want you to know what God did for others, He will do for you. Gordon. Well, coming up, her son was in the ICU. She was told he'd probably spend the rest of his days in a vegetative state. At a time when this mother was losing faith, see how a song from Mercy Me gave her hope for his healing. It's a miracle you don't want to miss. And then Ashley and I will be praying for you. That's coming up right after this. Get Miracle Living Today, the devotional magazine from CBN. This beautifully illustrated publication will build your faith with compelling articles shared by CBN hosts and special guest writers. Be inspired by powerful testimonies of people who have seen God answer their prayers in incredible ways. Call 1-800-700-7000. Visit MiracleLivingToday.com or text MIRACLE to 80888 to get your copy. I just couldn't keep anything down. The nausea and the fatigue, shortness of breath. As a nurse, I knew it wasn't just a flu. My prayer was, Lord, give me a diagnosis and give me a treatment plan. And give me a doctor who knows me and understands what's going on. And Gordon said, if you want to be healed right now, he said, you just put your hand on that body part. So I did. I put my hand. I said, Lord, I'm believing you that you can heal me. And at that moment, Gordon said, There's someone you're saying, please say Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. And so we're saying Crohn's disease for you. Let your body no longer fight against itself, but be restored now in Jesus' name. And I've had no issues since that time. And um, I just give God the glory for that. What I know is that Jesus touched me and that I've been healed. multiple injuries in multiple locations. That was the state of Cole Burton's brain. He was in a coma after getting hit by a truck on the side of the highway. 
Doctors said he'd probably spend the rest of his life in a vegetative state. His parents were devastated until they received a strange request. I'll take a look. I came inside from doing some yard work and I got a phone call from a strange number and it was Cole's professor. And he said, Cole's been in an accident. He said, he's still breathing, but, um, but it's bad. Charlie and Tina Burton will never forget the morning of May 24, 2018. At that moment, I was just frozen. I was just paralyzed, if you will. That day, as Cole and members of his geology class searched for rocks on the side of a highway, a truck careened out of control, striking Cole. The emotions that we felt, I think, were mainly just, just confusion and, and worry and, and hope that, that things would be OK. And we prayed before we, before we went and before we got on the road. Cole was life flighted to the UAB Medical Center. When the Burtons got there, they were devastated by the news. When the physician, along with the chaplain, came to speak to us, I knew that it was a grave situation. I knew that they were involved in a, a fight, if you will, a fight for Cole's life. He was already in a coma at the time that we saw him. We didn't realize that. But just as a mother, to see your child just laying there, you, you want to help them. Cole had suffered diffuse axonal injury, a condition similar to shaken baby syndrome. It's basically where a very fast start and stop, and the brain continues to move inside the skull and it creates a shearing type injury. And so it's multiple injuries in multiple locations. The Burtons began contacting friends and family to pray for Cole. My prayers at that point were not audible, intelligible prayers. They were groans, they were grunts. So our daughter, Libba, she did create this Facebook page, Pray for Cole, just to keep people updated. And we felt the prayers of our church family, of our family, of our community. All Charlie and Tina could do was wait. Five days in, they told us, you know, that no meaningful recovery and that he would probably be in a vegetative state the rest of his life. I started imagining, okay, so if this is what he's going to be like, how, as a mom, am I, am I going to take care of him? Cole had weaned himself off the respirator, but he started to storm, uh, brainstorming, and that meant he his heart rate was not regulated, his blood pressure, and it was almost as if Cole was running a marathon. And the doctors and the nurses said, you know, this is not sustainable. We're gonna have to put him back on the respirator. For that three weeks in ICU um, of just being on an hour by hour roller coaster, uh, time kind of stood still. The Burtons were sustained during their trial by prayer, and by music. When I couldn't pray, I would listen to music. And one of the main songs that I listened to was the song by Mercy Me, Even If. In the song, it says, it's easy to sing when there's nothing to get you down. That song became important to me because even if God chose not to heal him, that I knew Cole was going to be OK because we knew that Cole was saved and we knew where he, he would spend eternity. Strangely, we had this overwhelming sense of peace in that moment. God could have easily taken Cole at the scene of that accident, and he didn't. And we felt like if anybody had an opportunity to make it, it was Cole. After about three weeks, Cole began to respond. The nurses came running out into the waiting room and they said, he just said, mom. And it's like reverting back to when they're babies and, and just looking and wanting to hear hmm. that first word. He had a trach and he had the feeding tube. So we still didn't know what his future would look like, but we knew that he was responding to those commands. Even though they were baby steps, they were happening. Once he was stable, Cole was then transferred to the Shepherd Center in Atlanta for rehab. They said, uh, Cole doesn't have any sneakers and he needs sneakers. And I thought, well, that's uh, kind of maybe a cruel joke because Cole, uh, he's still not mobile, he's not verbal. And they said, no, we're gonna get him up. We're gonna get him moving. And uh, that was a sense of a hope. And we were like, okay, we're in the right place. 
Over the course of the next year, Cole continued to improve, exceeding all expectations. Although he has little memory of the accident, Cole remembers his time in rehab well. The people at Shepherd Center were so amazing and incredible in my recovery. Uh, they never showed an attitude of doubt that I would get better. Today, Cole is back at Auburn University and is functioning at about 90% of his previous capabilities. Cole and his family are also quick to credit the power of prayer. They told my parents that there wasn't a medical explanation for what happened. I tried to understand the brain and research so I would be knowledgeable and know what to ask when I went back to uh, see the doctors. And they said, hey, this is a miracle of God. Where two or more are gathered, and there were more than two, God is there and God is listening, and he heard those prayers. Our hope and our prayer through all of this and putting this on social media was not that people would see us, not that people would see Cole, but that people would see God and the power of God and what he can do when his people come together and believe and pray. Well, two or more are gathered right now. We're gathered in his name. You're part of that. Let Ashley and me be your two or more and realize that Jesus is in our midst. There is no time or distance in the spirit. He is where we live and move and have our being. And when we exalt him, when we're gathered together in his name, he's right there in the midst of us. Now, what name do we want to use today? Do we want to use provider? Do we want to use deliverer? Do we want to use savior? Well, how about we use the word healer? It's part of his nature. If we're gathered together in the name of healing, well, then healing is in our midst and we can reach up and grab it. So let's do that. In an act of faith, lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. Ashley and I will agree. The Bible says when two or more agree, it happens. So let's pray. Lord, we ask for miracles today. We call on your name, healer. You are the one who heals our disease. So stretch forth your hand and heal now in Jesus' name. Ashley, God's given you something. Yeah, I believe somebody's watching and you've had some type of, of heart procedure and heart surgery to the point where you actually have an incision on your chest. And I just believe God is, is healing whatever they were going in to do surgery for. God is healing that, but God is also rapidly healing just literally the scar and the incision right now. You'll be able to live a normal life once again in Jesus' name. Someone else, you've had a traumatic brain injury and you're saying, please say that your brain is being healed. Now, someone else in a car accident and your back is hurting, back is damaged, God's healing you now in Jesus' name. If you've been healed, let us know. Share your good report and call us 1-800-700-7000. To you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings.